All right, let's continue with NMR and look at a more difficult problem. So with more difficult examples, we need to exhaust all of our tools. So first, let's just observe the spectra and take some notes. We have seven carbons here, and it looks like we have seven carbon-13 signals. So no equivalent carbons here. The first thing that strikes me is the 1H singlet here, which is above 10 parts per million, probably close to 11 signal E close to 5 parts per million. Perhaps that's an alkene or aromatic compound. Let's see. And we have lower frequency signals here, A through D, 3H singlet, 3H doublet is B, and two 2H triplets close to 2.5 parts per million. So no equivalent carbons, no integration. It seems to be a straight chain compound in other words. Perhaps there's branching if we have an alkene, but we'll see. Now, the first thing I noticed was the 11 parts per million 1H singlet. That 1H singlet is typical of a carboxyl, which exists between 11 and 12 parts per million. So it's very likely we have a carboxyl and perhaps an alkene. Let's see, 5 parts per million 1H quartet. So it's probably adjacent to a methyl group because a methyl has three hydrogens and plus one would give me a quartet. And if we observe here, alkenes are very typical around 4.6 to even 6.5 parts per million. Our signal is close to 5, so this might be an internal alkene. But it could be terminal, we just have to find out. So if we have an alkene and carboxyl, DU should be 2, but we need to calculate that. So just like in previous examples, DU appears to be 2. We have oxygen in the compound, so 0 is accounted for. Remember, if you have any halogen in the compound, it counts as plus 1. And nitrogen and phosphorus in a compound is minus 1. So DU is 2, and that corresponds to a carboxyl and alkene. We confirm that with signals F and E. So let's analyze A through D. Now one thing that strikes me is that we have a 3H singlet, which is lowest in frequency, but we don't have a carbonyl, so this isn't a methyl ketone of any sort, nor can we have any methyl group on a carboxyl because we have the OH instead. So I'm not totally sure what signal A could be, but we know for sure it doesn't have any proton neighbors. That's why it's a singlet. So for signal A, I'll just put a methyl group bound to a carbon which has no protons. I'll label that X, Y, and Z. Signal B is also a methyl group, but this time we have an adjacent hydrogen, just one. So if we're referencing these hydrogens here, it must be bound to a CH group, which is then bound to two other non-proton bearing groups. Now it is possible that this methyl group is directly bound to the alkene that we were talking about. So I'll put that in here as well. Again, we're referencing these three hydrogens. Now signal C is a 2H triplet, which means it's adjacent to two hydrogens only. It's pretty low in frequency, it's close to two parts per million, so it's probably part of a hydrocarbon chain, and it's adjacent to another CH2 group, which I see here in signal D, another 2H triplet, a little higher in frequency. So my guess is that I have a CH2 group, which is then bound to another CH2 group, and on both sides, of this C2H4 group, I don't have proton bearing groups. So I'll just put X, Y, and Z for now. We'll just keep it in for now, and we'll look back at our chart and see what these groups could be, because any signal between two and three shouldn't be ignored. It could be next to a carbonyl, like we have in the carboxyl. It could also be adjacent to the alkene. So we'll analyze that right afterwards. But let's just review. Signal A is a 3H singlet because it's adjacent to a non-proton bearing carbon. Signal B is a 3H doublet because it's adjacent to only one proton neighbor. We said it could be next to the alkene, but we'll confirm that. Signals C and D together are 2H triplets of one another. And my guess was flanking the C2H4 group we don't have proton bearing carbons. That could be explained by signal A, the 3H singlet, which might be substituted on the alkene, and therefore any adjacent CH2 group won't have any neighbors. It's very likely we have protons that are adjacent to a carbonyl. 
as well as protons that are adjacent to an alkene. Anything adjacent to a carbonyl, which is part of the carboxylic acid, will also be around 2.1 to 2.6, but that could vary. Let's see. The allylic protons are between 1.6 and 1.9, and that satisfies this 3H singlet. So I have a methyl group substituted on an alkene. So I can redraw what I thought was signal A and draw a methyl group substituted on an alkene, like so. And this way, it is a 3H singlet because there are no proton neighbors. Now, protons that are adjacent to the carbonyl, like we said, were 2.1 to 2.6 parts per million. That could be evidenced by signal D, which could be a methylene group, a CH2 group, which is not only next to another CH2 group, but may be directly adjacent to the carbonyl. I'll revise signal D here and say that it's next to the carboxyl because it's around 2.1 to 2.6. So I'll redraw this portion here and say that the CH2 group bound to an R is bound directly adjacent to the carboxyl. And we know these two protons here, which I'm guessing is signal D, is a 2H triplet. So this isn't an R group, it's a CH2 group, which we already drew here, that's signal C. Now we've covered three carbons. In total, we have seven carbons. So let's figure out the signal E, which is part of the alkene, and then we should be able to put this together. Signal E is close to five parts per million, and we said it's probably an internal alkene. If it's an internal alkene, that means on both sides, we have R groups. I'll label this R prime. But the most important thing to note is that this hydrogen, as a part of the alkene, has three proton neighbors because it's split into a quartet. So it must be adjacent to a methyl group, which is evidenced by this 3H singlet, which we called the methyl group directly bound to the alkene. So I can put in a methyl group right here and a hydrogen right here. And this would be a 1H quartet. Now let's go back to our proton NMR spectra. We established that this alkene hydrogen is a quartet because it has three proton neighbors. But we also have another methyl group, a singlet, which is very likely bound right here. And that would be signal A, which was discussed here. Signal B, a 3H doublet, is actually this methyl group. Because if you analyze the adjacent hydrogen, it's this purple one. So now you can begin to tell how different signals sort of complement each other. And if you figure each one out one at a time and put some time into it, you can see how one validates the other and vice versa. So once again, let's count up our carbons here. In this fragment that we figured out, it looks like we have four carbons. Here, I have three carbons. So three plus four is seven. It seems like I figured out both fragments in this compound. Let's put it together and then validate all of the proton NMR signals. And the best way to do that is to answer the question, label the location of each signal. So let's start from the very beginning. We said we had a carboxyl, so let's draw that in first. We said that adjacent to it, we have a C2H4 group or two methylene groups. Let's draw that in. Now we left off by saying this was an R group, but if this signal here, which is a 2H triplet evidenced by signal C, it must be adjacent to a group here that is non-proton bearing. The only possibility is that it's adjacent to an alkene, which is bound to a methyl group. If this were bound to a hydrogen, this signal would not be a 2H triplet. It'd be a 2H quartet. So again, one signal validates the other, We'll put in our methyl group here and just transcribe this fragment that we're figuring out. So finally, this is my final structure. Now we just need to label.